Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, so 2020 is history, and 2021 is the year of new beginnings. Praise the Lord, right? Uh, COVID is almost in our past. Cross our fingers. Um, the theme for today is um, the word lives among us. And although we are going to be looking forward today into our, our bright futures, I do feel a little bit of an obligation to acknowledge our truly difficult uh, challenges over the last year of 2020. The passing of very de dear and cherished members of our church family, our own uh, individual families, the passing of our good friends, perhaps some of the isolation that we may have felt, the fears and anxieties of health concerns and job insecurities. Some of us undoubtedly have been concerned about or know people have friends that have been concerned about bankruptcy and financial ruin because of their small businesses being closed. Hardships have surrounded us in 2020, certainly. But no, we're not, of course, the first people or even the first Americans to face hardships or seemingly insurmountable setbacks. My mind goes back to the Great Depression, but there's certainly plenty of other examples. But as we look forward into the new year, we must acknowledge that there are opportunities, joys, dreams, and hopes that do lie before us, despite a difficult path that sometimes we encounter problems and struggles. But when we look back, it's always a joy to know that we have overcome those. Our scripture focus today, if I would say that it would, could be boiled down into one statement, and this is a long statement because it took me a while to get to this, is the life and words of Jesus or God, the life and words of Jesus are more than a simple announcement or statement. They are an explanation of God's attitude toward humans and his creation and of his desires and hopes for them. Let me read that again. The life and words of Jesus are more than a simple announcement or statement. They're an explanation of God's attitude toward humans and his creation, as well as his desires and hopes for them. Now, that's a long sentence to summarize a fairly long scripture focus for today that comes from John 1 verses 1 through 18. So let me boil it down into a much more simpler sentence. Don't let go. The book of John, as I'm sure many of you know, because most of you are uh, been around and probably studied it longer than I have, is really obsessed with proving Christ's divinity right off the bat. And perhaps the book of John is uh, one of the main sources that in the Council of Nicaea was used to justify Christ's divinity when they were debating the concept of the Trinity. In the first verse, it starts off with the words, in the beginning. And of course, this is there to recall the opening words of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The expression does not refer really to a particular moment in time, but assumes a timelessness. Then the word, which is repeated frequently throughout the scripture focus for today, or in its original Latin, logos, has several meanings and normally refers to the spoken word. And think about the spoken word for a moment. The Bible wasn't written down until long after Christ's death. And so it was just the spoken word. Here, though, it probably is meant to express a little bit more about the personality of communication. And finally, the Hebrew, the word of God, um, as we've translated it, was really a self-assertion of divine personality. In the Greek, it is presented as the concept of the rational mind ruled by the universe. So here, basically, John is really asserting that the word is the source of all the visible and is the source of all that is visible and really predates the material world, everything that we see. It is eternal. The word became flesh, 
is in verse 14 and is a contrast to the beginning whenever it states, in the beginning was the word. Sweetheart, I'm in the middle of a sermon. Can you step back, please? I'm good to be here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we have a, a progression of the concept of in the beginning. At the beginning of our scripture, it says, in the beginning was the word, and towards the middle, it comes out and says the word became flesh. Again, what John is getting to the point of is that Jesus was with the creation. Jesus is a part of creation, that Christ is eternal with God and existed in the beginning. Okay, honey, please go back to me. Okay, please go upstairs. No, you need to go upstairs, seriously. So what was the purpose of Christ? Well, we all have our ideas of the purpose of Christ. He came to save us. Or was it as complicated as what it says in verse 9? Was he the bringer of light and truth? Was it to give membership for the purpose? Was it to give membership for those who receive him a right to membership in the family of God? Was it to fulfill the word and the law? See, as you go through, there's lots of purposes for Christ, right? And if we really go back to what Steve Easy, the president of the church, likes to go back to, which is Isaiah, where Jesus goes into the temple in his hometown of Nazareth and proclaims his mission uh, to uh, proclaim release to the captives and make uh, the blind see again, etc. We also find in verse 17 that it said, the law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's another reason and the purpose of Jesus. And let me read that again, because I think that is the key that I want to speak about today. The law indeed was given through Moses. Moses was the bringer of law. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The contrast between law and grace as gods, our fathers, our mother, our holy parent, since we are all children of God, of course, that contrast between law and grace is really God's way of dealing with humanity. And it is clearly expressed in the Pauline letters, I think. The law represents God's standard for righteousness, right? That's what a law generally represents. Grace, of course, though, is exhibited frequently through God's or our parents or our mothers or our fathers. Standards, um, sorry, I lost my place. It's frequently represented through their attitude towards their children who could not keep the law. Again, you have a child that comes in and starts talking to you in the middle of the sermon, right? And you've got to have some grace in dealing with that, but yet you still have to have standards. There is a difficult journey that you've got to walk, right, between the two points. You've got to teach, but you've also got to show kindness and grace to the child. So think for a moment about the Sermon on the Mount, since we're about to be studying that in the adult Sunday school class. And the often popular repeated phrase that we're all going to remember is, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you. That's the difference between the law and grace. The life and words of Jesus are more than just an announcement is what I'm getting at. And what I think the scripture focus for today is saying. They are an explanation or an example of a parent's attitude toward their child. And of course, their desired best wishes and dreams for the child. Perhaps Jesus is the attitude of a parent put into action. Jesus represents how a mother would reach out to a lost, overwhelmed child who was mourning or crying after a particularly hard experience. Or maybe Jesus represents how a father would reach out to his long lost prodigal son that I believe Paul Bennett's talked about just a couple of weeks ago. 
regardless of how you relate to the advice God gives us in Isaiah chapter 43 that we heard about in the opening introit song this morning, the advice of a parent to a child is sacred, and I think that scripture encapsulates some of it. The scripture goes, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Not only is that great advice that a parent would give to their child, but it's also great advice at the beginning of a new year as we look forward into what is to come. But also from Philippians, one of the Paulinian letters, it says in chapter three, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. Now I kind of struggle with that because the first part says, I forget what's in the past. And I think there are plenty of examples of other scriptures where it says, don't just forget like it never occurred because we're going to carry that story with this forward. But what I really like about that scripture, it talks about how we are supposed to lean forward into the future, embrace it, focus on the future, focus on the positives that might be coming our way. In James chapter one, to emphasize that, it says, they are like those who look at themselves in, the, in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. So I kind of had to throw that in to kind of state what I was saying. Let's not forget what's in the past. We have to carry that with us, but not dwell on it. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice or fear, but rather a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. I think as we have went through COVID and the loss of our friends, very close and dear friends, it's important for us to remember that God gave us the power to struggle through and to to do great things and to make a difference and to create heaven on earth. Because this is the passion and the desire every parent has for a child, isn't it? Is for them to do great things, to do, go forward, to embrace their joys and depressions, also to prepare them for the struggles of life. God's message this morning through action in Jesus Christ is for us to not let go. God does not want to let go of us, and we, through taking communion today, express and declare as we did in the waters of baptism that we do not want to let go of God. With that in mind, we're shortly going to listen to a ministry of music or a moment of meditation of music from the music group Gentry. The title of the song is Don't Let Go, where I got the title of the sermon for today. And I want to read the lyrics to you before you listen to it so that you can really internalize the lyrics. For me, the lyrics of the song have reminded me of what I feel God has been telling me for the last four, maybe five years, beginning with the grief I felt with the loss of Naomi to this very moment with the frustrations of dealing with Alicia's work challenges and her resulting journey, which has in hindsight had a significant impact on me. The first verse, if we can go to that slide, Jonathan, says, when the night is fast asleep, but my heart is well awake, all my thoughts, they trouble me, and it's more than I can take, more than I can hold deep inside, I know. When my strength is weak, I can feel you carry me, in the darkness left for blind, I can feel your hand in mine, and your whisper heals my soul. Don't let go. Don't let go. You have been here by my side. Every plea you seem to hear. With new hope I come alive and forget my fe fleeing fears. Forget the tainted noise overshadowed by your voice. When my strength is weak, I can feel you carry me. In the darkness left for blind, I can feel your hand in mine. And your whisper heals my soul. 
And I plead with all I know, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go. This song really highlights the love of a parent, God, for his or her children. Here, that idea is presented in the video as a father and son in a story format like the prodigal son. Perhaps it re is also representative of the attitude of grace a parent or Christ has for a child that cannot keep the law. And yet there is still the complex component of a standard of righteousness being applied or the law. And the implications for both the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and the year of 2021 and how we are looking forward is also present in the video. May Christ be with you. Amen.